there are cases of awareness under anesthesia that, that's a mistake. You know, you don't give enough, you run out of, ga out of gas literally, or there's some other problem where people are aware when they're not supposed to be. Uh, and that's a terrible um, situation that we, you know, try to avoid uh, at all costs. Um, as far as we can tell under anesthesia, consciousness is kind of suspended. The, if you give enough anesthesia, the microtubules depolymerize, but that, that takes quite a bit more that, than what you need for, um, uh, for anesthesia. Now, you know, there's a dispute about this. P Buddhists say, well, consciousness never goes away. And it, in terms of consciousness in the universe, no, it never goes away. But I think within a particular brain, a particular time under anesthesia, the mechanisms that give rise to consciousness are kind of uh, are suspended. You know, it's kind of like the clutch is out and there's no engagement. And so the patient is, is unconscious. And just like we're unconscious when we sleep and don't dream, there's no consciousness. So I don't see a problem with consciousness kind of being in, in suspense or being suspended. But there's another effect that, that I think you were alluding to, we were talking about earlier. And uh, we have these, under, to uh, avoid uh, awareness under anesthesia, we have these anesthesia brain monitors. And they're simple electrodes, they go here and they measure gamma synchrony EEG and a few other things. And uh, they basically give a, a number, a, sim, uh, a number from zero to 100, for example, of the level of awareness. And what the number actually means, what it actually is, is under dispute, but they work fairly well. They're not, they're not perfect, but they work fairly well, such that awake people uh, would be between 80 and 100. And for anesthesia, you want them down between 40 and 60. And you don't really want to take them uh, below that necessarily. Now, these same devices have been used in the last few years particularly in a study by uh, Dr. Lakmir Chawla at George Washington University on dying patients. He has a palliative care uh, service. He's an anesthesiologist and an intensive care doctor. And uh, he, he uh, you know, patients who are terminally ill, hopeless, in a lot of pain, suffering, uh, elect to withdraw support. They may be on ventilators, uh, uh, pressors, medications. So they and their family decide, you know, let's just pull the plug, literally. That's the, the patient's decision, the family decision. So in so doing, they want to do, do this in a, in a humane way. And so uh, they, uh, Dr. Chow has been putting these brain monitors on these people as they die. And what he's found is, is just amazing. Um, if you look at the number, as the, as the heart, heart rate slows down and approaches standstill, zero, asystole, and as the bl blood pressure goes down, approaches no blood pressure, um, the, uh, so they might, they might start out at say 60 or 70 or 80, depending on, on their neurological condition. And it goes down to below 40, which is, uh, and then down say under 20, almost in some cases to zero. And at, at that point, the heart has stopped and, or is about to stop. Uh, the brain has to be acidotic and, and, uh, and, and uh, basically dying, if not dead. And this number goes almost to zero. And then with basically no blood pressure, uh, he finds these bursts of brain activity back up to 80, which, and when he analyzes them, they're in the gamma synchrony range, suggesting they're actually indicators of conscious awareness. And this, this activity, this end-of-life brain activity, lasts in his study. He studied seven patients, uh, and seven out of seven had the effect, um, um, lasts for anywhere from uh, 30 seconds to 20 minutes in some cases. And, you know, it's tempting to, to think that, that um, this brain activity is actually uh, the near-death experience, the white light, the tunnel, uh, maybe even out-of-body experience, and maybe even the soul leaving the body, who knows. Um, but of course, these patients die, so we can't, we can't ask them. We don't know for sure. But uh, in the future, there may be situations where one of these patients is revived and we, we can find out. But no matter whether, you know, no matter what, if you can prove that it's the uh, near-death experience phenomenology or, or the soul leaving the body, for that matter, it's still very interesting to, to ask, you know, how does the brain, when it's metabolically, metabolically dead, muster this global coherence? Now, some people say, well, it's just the neurons giving last gaps, get last gas firings because uh, of buildup of potassium and that sort of thing. But that doesn't work as an explanation because um, it's globally coherent. There's some kind of communi communication going on. So uh, he said, uh, I've, ta I've talked with him about it, and he said that he's, he's seen it hundreds of, hundreds of times. Now, he doesn't see it in every case. He, the, he published seven out of seven that he saw it in. He doesn't see it in every case, but he sees it a lot. And I, I've actually, as an anesthesiologist, I've seen it one time in a, in a patient for uh, in a heart donor um, uh, for giving, uh, who was brain dead, but still had this effect. So it's really remarkable, and we don't really understand it, but I think we're going to be seeing a lot more about it.